to you for help and you have healed me. O oh Lord, you have brought up my soul from Sheol. You restored me to life from among those who go down the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, O oh you, his saints, and give thanks to his holy name, for his anger is for but for a moment and his favor for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. By your favor, O Lord, you made my mountain stand strong. You hid your face, and I was dismayed. To you, O Lord, I cry, and to the Lord I plead for mercy. What profit is there in my death if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be merciful to me. O Lord, be my helper. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth. Clothe me with gladness, that my glory may sing your praise and not be silent. O Lord my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, we've been going through the Augsburg Confession, and I don't ever want to pull it apart and look at things out of their context. I think it's, it's important because... I put the, uh, these article titles so we can sort of see the first 20 on the left-hand side. Uh, if you remember from our introduction, these were laid out and not numbered, but were just an explanation of what it means to be a Christian. So what is a Christian? Well, the first 20 things tell us what Christianity is. And that was, that was kind of the point. Where they would explain this is what the Christian, not only what Lutherans teach, but this is what the church has said and taught forever. Because we remember that the, the Lutheran Reformation, whatever you want to call it, wasn't let's go break off and form a new church that would be, you know, not have any issues. But it was, this is the church, this is the doctrine that's handed down because when we read Paul and we looked at the Bible, we saw there was one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one teaching that Jesus handed over to the apostles, and now we have received two. So the first 20 parts go together. And so like, even though we've seen all these things, I kind of want to summarize these first articles so when we get to this one on baptism, we kind of see where baptism drops it, like, like the context of this article, okay? So first we have God. There was no discrepancy amongst anyone about this article, meaning that the Catholics were for it and they didn't confute it or say that's not true because these were the ecumenical creeds, right? This is the what we call the Apostles' Creed. And this is the Nicene Creed. And this is the Athanasian Creed. And we've talked about that and gone through that it's shown that those just confess what's already in the Bible. Which, that's what a confession is. A good confession is to same word it back to God. To say the same thing He says to us. And so, that's how we know our confession is either false or true. When God speaks, we say it back. And we say, yeah, that's it. And because these aren't articles like we talked about, of human reason, but of faith. And those aren't the same thing, even though we like to make them the same stinking thing, don't we? <laughs> we take articles of faith and we want to explain them. And we want to say more than God says about them. Because that's what sinners do, right? We take gifts and we take things and we sort of twist them. Just like Genesis 3. 
But um, here we have this article about God. So we say back about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the three persons, one God. Uh, that's what the church has always confessed. <clears throat> we looked at what all those false teachings meant and how those have been dealt with, and yet with they keep coming back <coughs> all the false things and they get called different things. Like today we have like Jehovah's Witness and we have some other things that speak differently about who God is. But they're really the same heresies that have always been around. Um, but then we dealt with original sin where there was a difference between what Rome was teaching at that time because Rome had moved away from the historic confession or what the Bible teaches about sin. They had a little different understanding. And so we looked at that, and one of the main things we saw that to be born in original sin or inherited sin means to be without faith. We are not born believing. But the way that this gets framed is that what we don't have is the first commandment. We break it. And so when we hear the first commandment, which is what? Yeah. You'll have no other gods. Yeah. And so we don't fear, love, and trust God. We don't believe Him. We don't love Him. Right, Steve? Which is the first table of the law summarized, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, strength. And the second is joined with it. In other words, we don't teach the second apart from the first, which is to love your neighbor as yourself. And everybody knows these things. They're in society. We call them the golden rule and things like that. But we know that. It's written on our hearts, even sinners, even though we distort it. And yet, thanks be to God for this third article, which is the Son of God who became flesh. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Right? Conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, to suffer under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried, descended to hell, ascend, uh, third day raised, ascend at the right hand of the Father, from thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. Uh, so that's, uh, this, this speaks about the one who is at the same time from his conception forward, true God and true man. One person. 100% divine. 100% human. Does that make sense to our human reason? No. No. Just like the three and the one doesn't make any sense. It's 200%. It doesn't make logical sense to express. Right. It's true. And that's all we have to kind of to. Yeah. So again, how do we know this? Because the Word tells us. Because the Bible says. Right. And then so we get into this central article, which is what he does for us. And it's really, this is what, what it means to be saved or to be forgiven. It's all from this article. And we looked at how this is the article uh, that Luther says in the small called articles, upon which the church either stands or falls. This is it. Everything flows from what Jesus does. And so in this, we, we keep seeing this whole Faith through faith, people are freely justified for Christ's sake through faith. When they believe and are received into favor and their sins are forgiven for Christ's sake. Not because of something they did or you did or I did, but because Jesus accomplished it for you. And so the other good news that's connected to it, because remember, these were not separated out. And that's part of what I wanted to go back to today, is that not only... Are we freely justified for Christ's sakes through faith, which is wonderful news, but also that we may obtain this faith, he gives this gift of a ministry. He gives pastors to churches. He gives people to preach and to give the sacraments through which we receive faith. Why? Because with the word and the sacrament is who? The Holy Spirit is given. Look at that one. We looked at this John 20. When Jesus is resurrected. And they're afraid of everything. Because maybe we're next. The disciples are thinking. Locked up in a room, scared to death. He shows up in their midst. 
and gives this gift and speaks his peace to them. So through the word, he delivers everything that he accomplished and gives it to them. So we condemn anybody, because we see these condemnations, and others who think that through their own preparations and works, the Holy Spirit comes. So we looked at all the Bible verses to talk about the Word and the Spirit are always together. So we have a certainty about the Holy Spirit. A sureness. We don't have to guess and come up with weird things to do to get the Holy Spirit, whatever the heck that means. <laughs> but we looked at the false teaching that we have in the churches, whether it be you know, a Pentecostal thing, or stuff that creeps into our own lives, where we think, well, if I do this, then... You know, surely God will respond and do this weird thing. Uh, but no, it's through what we would just call ordinary stuff. That seems to our eyes as ordinary. And yet there's always more than meets the eye because God's there. Just like we look at Jesus when he was on earth, and he looked like everybody else, didn't he? He's like, this guy said, it can't be this guy. It's Joseph's son, a carpenter's kid. But we know that that's the word in flesh. Why? Because the scriptures tell us. And the Holy Spirit gives us this gift of faith. And so this office is given, and then that faith produces what we call new obedience. It produces fruit. It does great things. And so we look at, at, uh, at these good works. That they're not anything we rely on to merit God's favor, but these are gifts that are given to you and me that we can walk in these things. And we looked at Ephesians 2. We looked at Luke 17. So that even if we do good things, we, we don't even know we're doing them because we're doing them in faith. Jesus testifies, so you also, when you've done all that you were commanded, say, Still, we are unworthy servants. We've only done what was our duty. And then we looked at Ambrose to see none of this stuff is new that we're teaching. None of it is something that just appeared in the 1500s. But this is what the church has always taught. So this is a long introduction. Sorry for it, but it's going to connect us to kind of where we're going. Because last week we looked at how do we know what the church is. And so 7 and 8 tell us it's wherever the gospel's being preached and wherever the sacraments are being administered the way that Jesus gave them. So people are being baptized in this place. Or people are receiving the Lord's body and blood or receiving an absolution. And Pastor Meyer has <coughs> a point. In the English, the one Lord, one faith, one baptism has the etc. It gives you the verse. Yeah. But in the original, the German, it also goes on down one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Yes. So you get the connection from the church yeah. to where you're going today to baptism. Sure. Yeah. It so it's the church exactly. to baptism. Thus, the context is okay, we're saved by this through faith. Right? Yes. We get the faith from the Holy Spirit who gives it and works it as a gift. For you are saved by grace through faith. This is not of yourselves. It's a gift. So no one can say, I got faith and you don't. Uh-huh. <laughs> you can't do that. Why? Because everything we have is a gift. Especially our faith. So when, I, when my brother's caught in a trespass, Paul says, I... Uh, I restore him in a spirit of meekness and consider myself, lest I also be tempted. Because I know it's only I stand and I walk by grace. And it's faith that receives that grace or that, that gift. And so uh, it's given to us through the, the office of the ministry, through wherever that word is preached, wherever baptism is going on and the Lord's Supper is going on. And... Uh, that's how we know what the church is because that's where Jesus is present doing those things. And we looked at the real presence of Jesus who's the one acting, doing. And so now we, we're going to go through the sacraments. And Article 9, in context of what's the church, 
which we've already said the church is wherever baptism is going on, wherever the gospel is going on, wherever the Lord's Supper is going on, or the absolution. So now we're saying concerning baptism. Our churches teach baptism is necessary for salvation. So we'll look up Mark 16, 16, so we know that verse. And someone else, be, uh, can someone else look up, uh, raise your hand if you'll look up Titus 3, 4 to 7. It's actually on your paper. <laughs> but, okay, you got that, Dave? Right. So I'll, re I'll just read this sentence here in paragraph 1. It's not really a paragraph, but it's got a one. Concerning baptism, our churches teach that baptism is necessary for salvation and that God's grace is actually offered through baptism. So let's read the verse that they have here uh, that shows us that baptism is actually something that we need. Go ahead, Mark 16, 16. Who's got that? Jesus said, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Okay. It's pretty simple. So, saved, condemned, baptism, I don't want baptism. <laughs> baptism, resistance of baptism. That's, what, that's what's going on here. I don't want that gift. Well, that's condemnation. And it's something that you wanted, something you chose. You didn't choose to be saved, but you did choose to reject baptism. <laughs> we looked at that with original sin. Uh, and then secondly, so it's necessary, and the second thing we, we have in this article is that it, God's grace is actually offered right here in this gift or sacrament called baptism. And so who has this Titus verse for us? David. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. We could spend probably 10 weeks on that, <laughs> those couple verses. But what I have here are some baptism verses uh, that are clear. And mainly because, you know, so I came from a Baptist background. Uh, meaning, Baptists don't really think baptism does anything, which is ironic because they're named Baptists. <laughs> right? I mean, it's kind of ironic. Uh, baptism's not that important, um, but it kind of is. Um, but it's not the same thing. And actually, we're going to look here in a second at some Baptist confessions of faith. Because I think that's important for us to know. What do Baptists actually teach about baptism? And don't just hear somebody say it, but here's what they say. And by the way, I even have some kind of generic, non-denominational churches, and I pulled from their website what they say about baptism, too. Because it's different from what Jesus says about baptism, and that's important for us to know uh, and to talk about. So... With, uh, with Titus 3 and with all these verses I've listed here, one of the things we'll see consistently is that baptism actually does something and gives something. It's not an empty sign. It's just this symbolic thing. But there's actual, according to Titus 4, uh, in fact, well, just look at that verse with me. Titus 4, 3, 4 through 7. You can look at it on your sheet or in your Bible. Paul, Paul says that when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His mercy. Doesn't that sound a whole lot like Article 4? The justification article? Like exactly like it. Right? So here we have, how are, how are any of us saved? Well, not because of something we did, but because of the works done, uh, but according to mercy. How? By the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. That sounds a lot like Article 5. 
doesn't it, that we looked at. So a washing, which the word washing and the word baptism are the same thing. Because what is baptism, what does it mean in the Old Testament? It means a washing. Literally to wash is what the word means. So when we're talking about baptisms, we are talking about a washing. Because that's what the word means. So um, Paul is using the word baptism here. Uh, and he calls it a washing or a baptism of regeneration. What, is a re what does it mean to regenerate? Okay, to make new, maybe even more than... Regrowth. Is what? Regrowth. Regrowth, right? Resurrection, right? Dead, from something that's dead, regenerates. It's new life. Does it rise from the ashes? Could. Are you going, are you going phoenix on me? Could be. You're going fiery phoenix on me. Uh, that's good. So... Um, yeah, regeneration and renewal, which is kind of what you're talking about, Steve. Uh, and the Holy Spirit's the one who does it, says Paul. Which Holy Spirit? The one he poured out. There's more baptismal language. Pouring out. Richly through Jesus Christ, so that being justified, there's the fourth article again, by his grace, we might become heirs. There's inheritance language according to the hope of eternal life. And then we have language that tells us that we have all the promises, the riches uh, that Jesus won for us. And where do we hear about a last will and testament and an inheritance? In the Bible. Somebody dies. Somebody dies, right? We know that. But where, what? What that Jesus has given us do we hear about being heirs and receiving an inheritance? Which is what it means to be an heir. This is the New Testament in my blood. The last will and testament of Jesus is how the, he's, he's, he's giving us the inheritance. What's the inheritance? The body and blood. It's Jesus himself. <laughs> For the forgiveness of our sins, and where there's forgiveness of sins, what else is there? Life and salvation. There's certainly there's life and salvation. We're saved, and so there's really rich language that Paul's using here. And in this, I don't think he he says anything about it being an empty sign or just it kind of represents stuff. So go God, <laughs> which is kind of the the mentality that we've come to in baptism in our culture. Yeah. Um, how did, if you read all these Bible verses, how is it that people say, well, you know, you don't really need baptism, the thief on the cross. You know, they always give you the thief on the cross thing. Sure. And it's like, but you read this, you can't be born of water and spirit, you can't enter the kingdom of God. Well, <laughs> how do you just... That's why, that's how. Yeah. But it's like... Sinful flesh. The I don't get it. Like, I just don't get it. We don't want to... And, and false teachers, right? This is why uh, we would we should always be on the guard. Like Old Testament, New Testament, we're on the guard against people who don't say what the Bible says. People who say something different. They have a new word from God or a different word. Which is why it's important for us to know what we believe, teach, and confess. What should we? Well, that's why we always go back to the small catechism, right? Because that, that gives us the stuff we need. And that includes baptism. Because it's necessary for salvation. Yeah. One thing I always think of with that, Walt, is because <clears throat> I end up talking about this all the time with my students. I teach in elementary school. Lutheran elementary school, we're about a third of the kids are Lutheran. And the other two thirds are parents who are interested in them having nice things or learning, learning to be nice or something. I don't know. But I talk about baptism a lot because I teach hymns and hymns talk about baptism. I always say, you know, if I have this present here, this is baptism. I can hand it to you and you can say, I don't want it. But it's still here. And one of the things that, you know, when you're dealing with kids is the fact that they're not necessarily in control of whether 
they get to be baptized. And that's a, that's a real thing. And so I said, and sometimes this isn't your option. And so I can hand it to you, but your parents can say, you can't have it. That's not the same as you saying, I don't want it. And so if it's one thing to not have had the opportunity of it handed to you, like the thief on the cross, right. but it's another thing for it to be handed to him and say, I don't want that. Sure. You know, that's a, that is a different way of looking at it. And, um, but one thing I also say to them is that present is always there. So if you reject it, it's still there that you can take it. Right. And, and it isn't that God said, well, he said no. Now it's, can't have it, you know. And, and, that, and that same thing goes, I, we had a higher things retreat and we had, um, oh, what's his name? Anyway, one of the higher things guys did such because so many of us have a case where we maybe have children or such that have fallen away from the faith mm -hmm. and he said you know it's very easy to think you know it's not like we say once saved always saved but if we think of when you are in that baptism when you're in the church you are in that boat you're in that ship of faith but when you reject the faith as such you jump out but when we're in water we don't drown necessarily now, maybe something will happen that you do drown. You don't get back in the ship. But remember, the whole time, Jesus is throwing you lifelines. And you may say, I don't want them. I don't want them. But he's still throwing them. And eventually, maybe, you'll grab hold. And then you pull back in, and you're in. It's not like you're halfway in. You're not hanging off for a while. You're back in the ship. And it's important to remember that, that God is always calling always it's our rejection is not does not change God's efforts to call us go go in, I'll get I see it uh, I see that hand that is very nice I didn't put out anything <laughs> um, but going back to your question too uh, you're asking how do Baptists not see that yeah so uh, when you're when you're taught something ahead of time that's sort of this preconceived idea or whatever, uh, then, then you read the Bible with that in mind. Sort of like you stand above the Bible with this sort of already made up mind that says, well, water can't save people or something like that, right? Which is why in the catechism, Luther asked that question, how can water do such great things, right? Um, so, or, or you think, well, Faith and baptism can't go together. So when I read verses about baptism, it can't mean this or that. That baptism does or gives something. Yeah. Um, and in fact, um, I, I do think it might be helpful to look at their confessions of faith once we get through this in a minute. But I want to go to Heather, who has a. I was actually like going back up to the water and that because you know, I it wasn't a child who was baptized. I was yeah. baptized as an adult. Yeah. And. Um, and so that they say that children are saved without baptism, and and why? How does the water and the cleansing get into the discussion that we're having? Um, it gets into the through the word. The only reason the water does anything is all because of the word. But why do we like? Why is there a difference between? Well, let's go to one of the arguments that you might hear: sprinkling versus immersion. You're talking about the modes or methods of baptism, yeah. how to baptize. Well, there's nothing said about that in the Bible. So then now we're just going with something, things that we make up. Because we already see there, there's verses that speak of sprinkling, both Old Testament and New. There's verses that speak of pouring. We just read that in, uh, in Titus, right? Uh, there's others that sound kind of like immersion or like the Baptist mode of it. That's not in the mandate of Jesus, though, right? Make disciples by baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So there we have the mandate. So if it's in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that's the word with the water that we go to, which is why Luther goes there uh, at the very beginning of baptism. and doesn't deal with the mode because it's not about how much water or how the water got poured on you, but the word with the water. 
with water has something to do with it? Well, the water that's taken up into God's use because he appointed it. And in fact, in his baptism, in our liturgy, right, you might remember this from other baptisms you've seen, that Jesus is, is he baptized? Right? But Jesus' baptism, when he's baptized, he's, he's baptized identifying as a sinner, right? Because that's John's baptism that he's given. He says uh, it's a baptism for the forgiveness of sins. Well, Jesus doesn't need baptism. Right? And yet Jesus receives baptism. And what, what does John do right when he receives baptism? He points at him and says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So in that moment, he enters in that sense, you could say the sin-bearing office, and takes that all the way to Jerusalem to the cross and bears it all. And on the way, he's receiving sickness and disease and, and the demonic oppression that he frees people from and all this stuff. Bearing it all in his body on the cross. And do I understand it? No. But did he do it? Yes. How do I know? Because the word says. We get tired of that answer, but that's just because we're sinners. We get tired of it. It's absolutely amazing, and Norm has to stand up. Right, following up on that really long sermon and, and Catherine. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. My question is, 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 is it, you know, uh, our timing. We want our kids or our grandkids to be baptized. I mean, I, I know so many of, of uh, you know, want their kids or grandkids to if be baptized. We believe but that it does it give that time. That timing is our timing, and it's not God's timing. So that we keep on praying, we keep on praying for our kids and our grandkids to be baptized or whatever, and and the graciousness of God is still there, constantly, you know, working. And who knows by the time we're we're on our deathbed, maybe. The, the word of God gets to those to those kids. I mean, that's God's timing. Yeah, and we, we don't ever have to doubt. Does Jesus want this baby baptized? Because we know He does, right? We don't have to go. I wonder if it's God's will that this person receive what I died to give them. No, we know He wants that, right? So we pray for that, knowing that it's the will of God, right? God desires all men to be saved. And if he saves through baptism, then he wants them, then he wants them baptized. But I get what you're saying. We're, there's the struggle going on why we want them to receive this gift. I have this with my, I have a, I have a relative who I really want to be baptized. Right? I don't have to go. I wonder if Jesus wants them to be baptized. No, I, we yeah. know that, right? I mean, I was just expanding. The sermon implied it was just oh, our, it, our graciousness to sometimes us. That but it, sometimes that God's we want that graciousness right. to go and fix this problem over here on our time. Right. And it's not our time. Right. Okay. No, that's good. Okay. Yeah. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits. It's I, not I, fun. I actually didn't listen to the sermon today as opposed to <laughs> most Sundays. Okay. Yeah. All right. Coming from a non denominational background, yeah. it's just taught differently. And the way that a non-denominational person will see it is they would say, if you think baptism saves you, you're working for your salvation. That's sure. how they see it. And so it's very hard for them to understand that, that baptism is something God is doing for them, not something that they're doing for God. Because it is seen sure. as like a proclamation of your faith. So it's something I'm doing for God. And people do it multiple right. times to show their faith. And so it's just taught differently, right. and it's very hard, especially as a parent, to raise your kids. What when your kids ask, "Why should I be baptized?" and you're like, "Well, I mean, because the Bible tells you to." Like that's kind of the only answer you can give. Like, you know. But then when you're taught that God is giving you faith, it makes so much more sense. So it's just it's really hard because it's just taught differently. It, yeah, it's taught wrong. Yeah, um, yeah. And in that teaching, you bring up a good point. We confuse the law and the gospel, and that's yep. the heart of the error, yep. right? And this is the heart of, that we, sh th this is the error that we struggle with and will struggle with as long as we remain as sinners in sinful flesh, right? We're going to want to take God's gifts and turn them into something we did, we cooperated with, or we are a part of, right? And so we take baptism and we flip it. Yeah. And that's part of what's going on. Uh, 
What, what's ironic with that is um, the reason that uh, I have all these verses in here, and there's way more, obviously, on baptism that we could have gone to. I don't even have Matthew 16 and Matthew 28, which are in the Catechism. But on all these verses, you can look at these things, and you can see it's not an empty thing, right? Jesus is giving us a gift through this. Whoever's baptized, uh, in fact, into his name, is him marking you as his own, right? To be the place where God's name is, is the place in the Bible of his blessing. The place where he says, I'm committed here. Where my name is, there's my blessing. And so, committed how? To be with you, always, to the end of the age. To fight for you, to, to, to love you, to keep you to the end. So these great treasures and promises in baptism um, and we like to take a little part of this salvation thing and say, now oh, I did a little bit. Because <laughs> you know? that's what it means to be a sinner is to want to do it or to justify yourself. And so we see these Anabaptists that get condemned in this article, which, by the way, what does Anabaptist mean? I'll get to you. I have a problem. Against baptism. Again. Again. Yeah. Again, Anna, again, baptizers. Yeah. So this is their confession of faith. I never read this till this week, this thing. And I would first Mary, let's get to your question. Before we... I was raised Roman Catholic. Right. I need to baptize. <coughs> well, yeah. And, and so for the first 1,500 something years of the church, this was not even a thing, right? This wasn't something where we go, oh, well, um, maybe there's these Baptists. Over. They were never part, they were always sects that were excluded from the church. No one ever thought that that was real Christian teaching. For 1,500 something years until these Anabaptists start coming around and teaching this weird thing called rebaptizing and talking about this other stuff. Uh, this is 1527, which, by the way, is two years before the catechism is written. And somebody had a hand up back here. Yeah. They have uh, multiple Baptist friends uh, that they've been baptized multiple times. Does that mean that they're going to hell? No. No. So, uh, so to be baptized is to to be given the name, right? If it's in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If it's a baptism in the name, because that tells us in the name actually who's the one who's baptized. That's what the large catechism says, is that to be baptized in the name is to be baptized by God himself. And so when the Lord baptizes, he does everything he promises and says. He gives everything that the Bible says. And there's one baptism, one Lord, one faith, and all that. The other times that we do it, that we see people get wet, they just get wet. <laughs> So they're wet the other times. Because my wife's been baptized how many times? But not really. <laughs> Five or six. I'm three. Um, but, but really only once. The other times weren't, they weren't baptized. We call, they may have called them baptism. That's not a baptism. Because he, the Lord had already done it. And so what we do is... Baptism now saves you. That's one of the verses here in 1 Peter 3. In other words, it still continues to work today. Right? And so really, even confession and absolution, repentance is a working of baptism, isn't it? It's that promise has been given to you, and now you're turned from your sin and brought back to this promise that the Lord now still speaks to you. It's the same word and the same promise that you were given from the beginning. Well, I think I have a new line. Yeah. It's like, if Christ, who didn't need to be baptized, got baptized, you just combine that with the first Peter verse and say, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you do that? You know, why wouldn't you want this sure. gift? Well, and, and in that, though, um, the Baptists use that. Because I used to use it and say, you need to follow his example and be obedient like Jesus was oh. obedient. So you got to be careful with that. Because then you're going to teach baptism is something you do rather than the gift that you received. Because baptism is something the Lord does to you. 
through the hands of whoever baptized you, right? Through the speaking his word through the mouth of whoever spoke them that the Lord used, right? Um, so going back to your friends, uh, baptized once for all, right? One time. But, um, okay. So here's this one. I kind of want to skip this one because this one's too old. <laughs> uh, we're running out of time. And then there's the 2000 Baptist Faith and Message. Can I ask a quick question? You can ask as many questions okay. as you want. They can be long. Okay, so, so the question goes to the second clause of the article um, that saying that like being offered to God through baptism, they are received into God's grace. I grew up with a different definition of baptism that we haven't talked about yet, but it had to deal with purification. And so, can we purify ourselves? No. So therefore, like, is is baptism purification? Yes. But whose purity is it? God. Yeah, whose holiness is it, if you're going to say? You are holy by the Holy Spirit. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He holies, and he does it through baptism, by bringing Jesus' gifts and finished work to you, delivering that gift. Does it actually, does that answer the question a little bit? Yeah, it's a question for discussion. Oh, okay. <laughs> You're bringing a discussion. I couldn't tell if that was a real thing. It is a real question, but yeah. So, so yeah, holy, uh, the purification comes from who, whose holiness is it? Christ. No one's holy but God. <laughs> right. But yeah, Christ. whose righteousness is it? It's Christ. Whose holiness? All of it. Um, so uh, it's not my purity. It's a received purity or purification or cleansing. Yeah. So um, there's... This one, I, I kind of want to get, because we only have five minutes, I kind of wanted to get to these things. Because um, I looked up kind of these generic churches that have weird names that don't really say much that they're a church, but uh, but they kind of have these names. Uh, I don't know, like The Journey or something. That's not a church that I know, so I just say The Journey. But... Um, Kind of the generic church where you're like, first Christian church, and you're not really sure what they believe. You go to the website and you pull stuff off. I picked uh, several churches that are fairly large around Rockland and Roseville, and this is from their websites, what they teach about baptism. Um, so let's look at the first one, baptize. We're so excited about your decision to publicly declare your faith in Jesus. So we already have a problem, don't we? With the first sentence. What's the problem? They're excited. <laughs> it's what? Excited. The exclamation mark is kind of a problem. Okay, we're so excited. You have to have a southern accent to say it. We're so excited about your decision. Uh, so do we decide to to believe? No. No. no, we already said this. I got the smack down on that, we do not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Amen. Well, we should, we should have to say, no, we've been looking at this and studying this, that faith comes from the word and the gift of the Holy Spirit through the gospel and the sacraments, meaning baptism. So, okay, that that's not good. And then here's their definition. Baptism is the wedding ring of Christianity. Okay which means a symbol, right? Showing, showing your commitment to follow the path God has for your life, whatever that is. It's a secret path that you've found because you feel it in your heart. A lot of problems with that, right? That's super uncertain, which is the bottom line, because you know your sin, and I know my sin, and I don't follow any paths regularly. I'm kind of a wreck, and I do this every day. You, so I got no even up there at the top, publicly declaring yeah, faith. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what are we doing it for to show off to other people that uh, that I got faith in Jesus? Well, and most of these websites, I found this ironic, and I learned something that they didn't have in what we believe. They had a little section in most websites, our beliefs, right? Well, 
this was baptism, you had to look for it. It was not in we believe or our beliefs, it was in next steps. <laughs> so they don't teach it's necessary for salvation like the Bible says. It gives anything or does anything. Uh, but it's something you do. Thus, the confusion, you've turned the gift of Jesus into something I do, which makes it the law, doesn't it? It makes it something I do. The wedding ring, uh, I'm going to show my commitment. How do you know I'm committed to God? I'm going to declare it through getting baptized and wearing a ring publicly. Um, so the, the path got turned. There's a lot of problems because we can't even dissect it out. But they are excited. <laughs> that is for and sure. Say it again. And they want to celebrate with you as you take the next step. Which church so you're here, you started here, and you get baptized, you take the next step. Almost up here. But you got to do a lot more steps. That's when you put it on Facebook. When you put it on Facebook. <laughs> By the way, this is the opposite of what the Bible teaches. Right? This is actually what Cain taught. <laughs> We've talked about the church of Cain and the church of Abel. Faith works. Um, so, next, baptism. Water baptism, it's an opportunity. <laughs> I like to take advantage of opportunities. Uh, for those 12 years old and up, how did that number come up? It's pushing it back. So it's an eight. That used to be like three or eight. No, it's 12 now. It's 12 now. I know a church in town that's 18. Well, it's a Baptist oh, church here in town. It's 18 because then you can sign legally their covenant of membership where they can kick you out of the church if you do something they don't like. And hand over your taxes. And hand over your taxes. I'm not lying. This is here in this area. Uh, and it's not just here. It's there everywhere, right? Um, so an opportunity for 12-year-olds and up who have recently accepted Jesus into their lives. Not good Bible language, is it? Kind of like decision language. Okay, I accept it. That means it's true. Now I receive it. I receive the gift. So re reception is faith language. Accepted is human will and try harder language, which ends poorly every time. Um, into their lives and want to take. Look, we have the stupid thing again. This next step is nonsense. To celebrate. Next step to celebrate. Guys, they like celebrating. They I can, really like I can change my gender at age five, but right, I can't get baptized until I'm 12. That's right. That's just beautiful. Well, you received your What's wrong with I mean, what's the way I was born? Um, so get baptized. And I just put, that's straight from the website. It just says get baptized. <laughs> And I don't think any of the, oh look, we have additional steps in the last one. <laughs> so let's walk in obedience to the Lord together. So we have now obedience to the law. Obedience is law language, right? It's Ten Commandments language, okay? So we've taken baptism and we've said, oh, it's a law. And that's why a lot of times the Baptist church, and sometimes the Reformed church will use the word ordinance instead of sacrament or uh, mandate or something like that. They'll use this word ordinance. This, this focus is on something I'm doing. So when Jesus tells us to be baptized, gives a commandment. Uh, he in, is inviting us. Okay, that's good language, inviting us. Uh, but to mark our new life, we're going to mark our new life? No. Baptism is receiving the name and being marked by God, right? So they kind of almost get some things almost right, but not. Um, inviting us to mark our new life with him by identifying with his death, uh, burial, resurrection, which is it's almost true, right? That's almost Romans 6, except Romans 6 says something different, and turn to it on here. It's your second verse right here, Romans 6, 3, 2, 5. Gosh, we gotta stop. Okay. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ, okay, first of all, we have been, something's happened to us. We were baptized by somebody else. We didn't do the baptizing. But somebody baptized us into Christ. We're baptized into his death. We were buried. We didn't do the bearing. We were buried. How? 
by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, there's our regeneration language again, resurrection language, uh, by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Something we receive, something He does for you. Um, so anyway, we'll, next week we'll finish this, and I want we'll get to infant baptism next week because that's the big thing uh, with Baptists. They don't want to baptize. They don't want to let Jesus baptize them. So, yeah. Anyway, so I think a lot of this comes down to perspective in which we read the Bible. Most people, or a lot of Christians, read the Bible through the lens of the Bible, and they don't read the Bible as if it's a self-help book. What must I do in order to do that? So when they read the Bible, they read this, what must I do? It's an instruction manual. It's an instruction manual. And in fact, they use that language, too. And actually, what it is, is what's God done for us? And we have to just kind of look at it. He hits us upside the head with a lot of law in there. but he In order that. In order to tell us what he's done. So that we can kind of understand what he's done. We don't really understand what he's done unless we... Get hit upside the head. Do it. Me. Well, um, that's okay. Let, let's pray. Our Father. Lord, I pray. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses. And as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you. Amen.